the Joe Rogan experience. I wanted to talk about you, like where you are right now in your life and how you're handling this. Uh, Cause yeah. you've been in exile for how many years now? Uh, it's been more than six years. Six, now. Uh, six June years. June of 2013. Yeah. I mean, well, actually I, I left uh, May. So what yeah. is life like? I mean, <laughs> are you in constant hiding? I mean, uh, what, what are the issues like? In, in the beginning, um, my uh, operational security level, uh, as we would call it, was, was very high. Uh, I was concerned uh, about being recognized. I was concerned about being followed. I was concerned, uh, really, uh, about very bad things happening to me because the, the government made it very clear that from their position I was the most wanted man in the world. Um, they literally brought down uh, the president of Bolivia, uh, his aircraft, uh, and would not let it depart uh, as it tried to cross the airspace of Europe, not even the United States. Uh, they wouldn't let it leave until they confirmed I was not on board. Um, so, yeah, that, that made me a, a little bit nervous. But you can't live uh, like that forever. And although I was uh, as careful as I could be, um, I, I still lived uh, pretty happily because I was an indoor cat to begin with. Right? I've always been a technologist. I've always been uh, pretty nerdy. Um, so as long as I have a screen and an internet connection, I was pretty happy. Um, but uh, in the years past, my life has become more and more open. You know, now I, I speak openly, I live openly, I go out, I ride the metro, I go to restaurants, I go, you know, how for, often for are you recognized? Park. So this is a, a funny thing: is I'm almost never recognized. Um, one of those things is I don't give uh, Russian interviews um, because I, I don't want my face uh, all over the news. Um, which is nice because it just allows people to, to sort of forget about my face um, and I can uh, go about my life. But uh, I, it, it's one of the weird things that I'm, I'm recognized uh, a couple times a year, uh, even when I'm, I'm, I'm not wearing my glasses, uh, in a, a museum or a grocery store or something like that or out on the street, just by somebody who I swear, like, these people are, are you might have read a story about them, like, super recognizers, the people mm. who just have a great memory for faces. Yeah. Uh, because I can be, like, wearing a hood and, like, a, a jacket. I can have a scarf around my face, like, in the winter. And, it, like, you can barely see my face. And they'll come up to me and they're like, are you... Snowden? And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know, that's, what do you say? That's pretty impressive. I'd say, yeah. Yeah, wow. It's nice to meet you. Um, and, uh, yeah, they've, it's, I've, I've never had a negative interaction um, from being recognized. But for me, because I'm a privacy advocate, like, I would, I would much rather go unrecognized. Like, I don't want to be uh, a celebrity. Um, but the other thing is uh, I'll get recognized in computer stores. And I, I think there's just, like, a mental association uh, where people are, like, their, their brain when it's cycling through faces that it recognizes, it's going through like the subset of nerdier people or something like that when you're in a computer store. Because for whatever reason, um, I'm recognized much more frequently when there's some kind of technological like locus. Mm. Um, so you're living freely. Did you had to learn Russian? Did you learn it? Yeah, I mean, my, my, my Russian is still pretty crappy um, to, to, to my great shame because all of my life, all of my work is primarily in English, right? right? Did, now, um, you've talked about returning home if you could get a fair trial. Is, is that a feasible thing? A fair trial for someone like you? Is that such a... Well... Is that, yeah. is that even <laughs> it's possible? It's a good question. <laughs> I mean, uh, look, if, if we're being frank, uh, I, I think all of your audience knows uh, the chance of me getting a fair shake in the Eastern District of Virginia, a couple miles from the headquarters of the CIA, uh, is probably pretty slim uh, because that's where they draw the jury pool from, right? right? Um, but uh, my objection here is on a, a larger uh, principle. Right. What, what happens to me is less important. Right? If I spend the rest of my life in jail, that, that's less important uh, than what I'm actually requiring the government to agree to, uh, which is a single thing. Right? Uh, they say, face the music, face the music, and I'm saying, great, let's pick the song. Um, the thing is, 
The law that I've been charged under, the one that all these whistleblowers have been charged under, Thomas Drake, uh, Daniel Ellsberg, Chelsea Manning, Daniel Hale, the drone whistleblower who is in prison right now going through a trial that is precisely similar to what I would be facing, uh, his lawyer uh, is asking the court or, or telling the court uh, that we want to tell the jury why he did what he did. Uh, that the government is violating the laws, uh, the government is violating human rights, um, that these programs are immoral, that they're unethical. Um, this is what motivated this guy to do it. And the jury should be able to hear why he did what he did. And the jury should be able to decide whether that was right or wrong. And the government has responded, you know, to this whistleblower argument, basically, saying... We demand the court forbid this guy from breathing the word whistleblower in court. He cannot talk about what motivated him. He cannot talk about uh, what was revealed, why it was revealed, what the impacts and effects were. He can't talk about whether the public benefited from it or was harmed by it because it doesn't matter. Now, this might surprise a lot of people because uh, to a lot of us, we think that's what a jury trial is. We think that's what a fair trial is. Uh, but the Espionage Act that the government uses against whistleblowers, uh, meaning broadly here the sources of journalism, um, is fairly unique in the legal system in that it is what's called a strict liability crime. A strict liability crime uh, is what the government considers to be basically a crime worse than murder. Because if you, if you murdered somebody, like if you just, I don't know, beat Jamie with the microphone stand right now, um, you would be able to go to the court and say it was self-defense, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you, you, you felt threatened. You were in danger for your life. Even if you weren't, right? Even if you obviously weren't. Even if you were on tape, you could still argue that. And the jury could go, you're full of crap, right? And, and they could convict you. But if you were, in fact, acting in self-defense, and if the jury did, in fact, believe you, they could take that into consideration in establishing their verdict, Right? Strict liability crimes forbid that. The jury is not allowed uh, to consider why you committed a crime. They're only allowed to consider if you committed a crime. Uh, They're not allowed to consider if the murder was justified. They're only allowed to consider if the murder took place. And the funny thing in this case is that the murder that we're talking about is telling the truth. The Espionage Act, in every case, is a law the government exclusively uses against people who told the truth, right? Like, that, that's what it's about in the context of journalism. They don't bring the Espionage Act against people who lied. Then they would use fraud or some other statute. Uh, they say that the government is arguing in the context of whistleblowing that telling an uh, telling a important truth to the American people by way of a journalist is a crime worse than murder. And I believe, and I think most Americans would agree, this is fundamentally, indefensibly wrong. And so my whole argument with the United States government since the very beginning was been, I'll be back for a jury trial tomorrow, but you have to agree to permit uh, whistleblowers a public interest offense. It doesn't matter whether they are a whistleblower or not. Uh, it's just they argued. It's the jury that decides whether they are a whistleblower or not. Uh, they have to be able to consider the motivations of why someone did what they did. The government says we refuse to allow that because that puts the government on trial. And we don't trust the jury to consider those questions. Wow. So you have had these conversations then. So this has been discussed. Oh, yeah. No, this is, this is from the Obama administration. Uh, there's been no contact uh, since, since the Trump administration. Uh, because the government basically, when they got to this point, they went, we have no good argument against this, uh, and we will never permit this to happen. And, and again, I just want to make clear, this is not uh, speculation. This is not um, me thinking. This is actively happening in the case of Daniel Hale right now. I hope you guys can pull up a, a, a graphic for it, because this story just at the papers like two or three weeks ago, I'm um, saying the government is forbidding this guy from, from making this argument. So you're, situ you're, you're seemingly in a state of limbo then. You're, they're not yeah. actively pursuing you, it seems, that you, if you're able to move around freely. They, they haven't discovered where you are. You're just free to live your life. You, 
Well, yeah, yeah. I sort mean, of. it's it's one of these things where <laughs> you know, whether they they know where I am or whether they uh, don't know where I am, where I put my head on the pillow, doesn't matter so much. Uh, I'm in Russia, right? And and we should lean into that because I think people. Uh, they hear Russia, particularly in the context of today's news, and you see like what people are saying about Tulsi Gabbard and things like yeah. that. Uh, any kind of uh, association, any any time your name appears in the same sentence, same paragraph, same story uh, as the word Russia, it, it's considered a negative thing now. Um, and don't get me wrong, I've been a long-time critic of the Russian government. Uh, I just actually had a major story uh, written about me in uh, a Russian state news uh, outlet called Ria Novosti. Uh, you guys could, could probably pull it. It's only in Russian, though. Um, that's saying because I spoke favorably about a member of the Russian opposition, uh, Alexei Navalny, um, which I, I wasn't even speaking uh, positively about this guy. I was saying, look, uh, I think people have a right... Uh, to express their opposition in a country, uh, and they should be able to do that without fearing retaliation in the future, uh, because the background here is this this opposition figure uh, has been a long time thorn uh, in the Russian administration side, and uh, they've just suddenly magically uh, been accused of being foreign agents or something like that, um, and so everyone connected to this, which is like a big civil society body, uh, had their doors like simultaneously kicked in across the country and they're being investigated for some kind of corruption or something. It, it doesn't even matter. Um, and, you know, I, I said I opposed that, just like I was tweeting, you know, um, footage of uh, ballot stuffing in the Russian elections, just like I've criticized the Russian president by name. I've criticized... Um, Russian surveillance laws, uh, so many things again and again and again and again and again. Um, but yeah, so l look, it, it does not make my life uh, easier uh, to be trapped in a country that I did not choose. And people don't remember this. I was actually en route to Latin America uh, when the U.S. government canceled my passport, which trapped me in Russia. And for those who are interested, again, <laughs> I wrote an entire book uh, that has a lot of detail on this. Um, but uh, yeah, it's difficult to be uh, basically engaged in civil opposition uh, to policies of the United States government at the same time as the Russian government. Um, and it's, it's a hard thing, you know. And it, it, it's not a happy thing, but I, I feel like it's a necessary thing. The problem is nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to engage in that kind of nuance. Nobody wants to consider those kind of conversations. Um, in the current world, people believe, and this is actually one of the worst things that uh, Western media does in, in the context of discussing uh, Russia, is they create this aura of invincibility around the Russian president. They go, you know, this guy's calling all the shots, he's pulling all the strings, you know, this guy's in charge of the world. Um, and that's very useful uh, for the Russian government broadly, uh, because they can then take that and replay that on their domestic media, and they can go, look how strong we are. You know, the Americans are afraid of us, the Chinese are afraid of us, everybody's afraid of us, the French are afraid of us. Uh, we are strong, right? Um, there's no question that Russia's going to be interfering in elections. There's no question that America's going to be interfering in Russian elections, right? Nobody, nobody likes to talk about this. And again, I need to substantiate that now that I've said that. I've got an old note that I've cited a billion times. Um, the New York Times... Uh, publish a story in the wake of, you know, this contested 2016 election uh, where they looked into the history of electoral interference uh, in Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, and they found in uh, roughly 50 years, 36 different cases uh, of election interference by Russia or the Soviets, right? This is not a new thing. This is something that always happens because that's what intelligence services do. That's what they think they're being paid for, uh, which is a sad thing, but it's a, it's a reality because we aren't wise enough to separate covert action from intelligence gathering. Uh, but in that same uh, study that they found 36 different cases uh, by the Russians and the Soviets, they found 81 different cases uh, by the U.S. And this was published by Scott Chain in the New York Times and both uh, the Washington Post as well. But this is, this is the thing, like... There is a way to criticize the Russian government's policies without criticizing the Russian people, who are ordinary people 
who just want to have a happy life. They just want to do better. They want the same things that you do, right? And every time people go, oh, Russia, Russia, Russia. Every time people go, Russia bad. Every time they go, Russia's doing this. They go, Russia's doing that. Russian people who have nothing to do with the government feel implicated by that. Like, do you feel uh, like you're in charge of Donald Trump? Like, do you want to be have Donald Trump's legacy around your neck? And then people go, oh, well, you know, you could overthrow Donald Trump. You know, you could overthrow Putin. Can you? Really? Like, is that how it works? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, look, I have uh, no affiliation. I have no love uh, for the Russian government. It's not my choice to be here. Um, and I've made it very clear I would be happy to return home. Is for there any trial. concern that applied. they would deny you visa? I mean, how, how are you staying there? It's it's a good question. So I have a permanent residence. People think I'm under asylum, but I'm no longer under. It's like a, a green card now. Um, it's got to be renewed every three years. Uh, so yeah, sure, it's possible they could kick me out. And this was what the story I was uh, telling you about before in Russian media was. They were saying, you know, the Russian government should take some action against me, uh, or I shouldn't be welcome here, or I should go home. Uh, because why is he criticizing the Russian government, right, when they're the people? Who is that are, like the uh, Russian away, version of Fox the News? Away. <laughs> is that what they have I, over there? I don't know enough about Russian media to tell you. Mm. Uh, I think it's supposed to be more like a Reuters or Associated Press, but the hell if I know. Mm. Um, but uh, the, 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 the thing is this. What's the alternative? Right? Um, yes, the Russian government could screw me. But they could screw me even if I didn't say anything. Uh, and so should I shut up and be quiet? Uh, in the face of things that I think are injustices, uh, because it makes me safer. Well, a lot of pragmatic people will say, yeah. They say, you've done enough. They say, you've done your part. You know, they say, whatever. Uh, be safe, live long, be happy. Um, but I didn't come forward to be safe. If I wanted to be safe, I'd still be sitting in Hawaii, making a hell of a lot of money to spy on all of you, right? Uh, and nobody ever would have known about this. The system would have gotten worse. Uh, but the system... The world, the future, gets worse every day that we don't do something about it. Every day that we stay silent about all the injustices we see, uh, the world gets worse. Things get worse. And yeah, it's risky. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. But that's why we do it. Because if we don't, no one else will. All those years I was sitting, hoping for someone else to come forward, and no one did, right? That's because I was waiting for a hero. But there are no heroes, right? There's only heroic decisions. You are never further than one decision away from making a difference. It doesn't matter whether it's a big difference. It doesn't matter if it was a small difference because you don't have to save the world by yourself. And in fact, you can't. All you have to do is lay down one brick. Right? All you have to do is make things a little bit better in a small way so that other people can lay their brick on top of that or beside that. And together... Step by step, day by day, year by year, we build the foundation of something better. But yeah, it's not going to be safe, but it doesn't matter. Because individually, it's, it's not, uh, you know, me, whoever you are, that's the Iron Man. Right? I don't care if you're the biggest doomsday prepper with cans full of beans. Uh, if the world ends, it's going to affect you. We make things better. We become safe together, right? Collectively, that is our strength. That is the power of civilization. That is the power that shapes the future. Because even if you make life great for you, you're going to die someday. You're going to be forgotten someday. Your cans of beans are going to rot someday. You can make things safer. Uh, you can be more careful, right? You can be more clever, and there's nothing wrong with that. But at the end of the day, you have to recognize if you're trying to eliminate all risks from your life, what you're actually doing is eliminating all possibility from your life. You're trying to collapse the universe of outcomes uh, such that w what you've lost is freedom. You've lost the ability to act because you're afraid. That's a and beautiful that's what way to got put us it. into this mess. That's a beautiful way to put it. <laughs>